Hi everyone. Looks like we've got lots of people logging in. So we might start and get going. So welcome. Um, my name's Anne Dixon and um, welcome to this afternoon's uh, Connecting with Nature webinar. Uh, today we've got uh, what I hope will be a very interesting talk, in fact what I'm sure will be a very interesting talk, uh, on Gardens for Habitat and Bush Tucker with Samantha Newton. But before we get underway, I would first like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're having this webinar on today. Um, wherever you may be and the traditional owners of your area, I'm in Gadigal country um, of the Eora Nation, and uh, I'd like to pay respects to elders past, present, emerging. So welcome once again, and um, here, um, first of all, I think I should run through some housekeeping. I've got a list here. Um, first of all, the webinar is being recorded, just so you know. Um, and if you've got some questions, there's a QA and a button down the bottom. So you can put the questions in there and that'd be great. And we'll, we'll ask Samantha, um, we'll probably either during the uh, session, if there's a natural break or at the end of the session, um, if you've got any comments or question, comments, just put the use the chat function and the questions in the Q&A, that would be great. Um, now, just a reminder that this webinar, well, it's being recorded so that we can upload it. And if you haven't seen any of the previous webinars, they're uh, available on the website as well. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'd like to introduce Samantha. Um, many of you will know Sam. Uh, she's... Uh, uh, been around MPA for quite some time, uh, but her background is um, she actually went to uni to start zoology, but ended up with a degree in botany and ecology. I think like many of us, you end up changing on the way through. And plants have been a pretty major interest for Sam ever since. Uh, her involvement in conservation started with the Nature Conservation Council in various roles. And I think, I don't think I could even name the number of roles she's had at National Parks Association. Uh, many will see her, many of you will have known her at the, her current role as um, uh, communications coordinator. So after her degree, Sam moved to Macquarie University and uh, got quite involved with the plant and ecology researchers there and teaching of gardens uh, and the teaching of gardens at Macquarie. And this led her to pursue, um, I guess, her interest in garden design more fully. And she's further, done further study in horticulture and landscape at Ride TAFE. And she's also started her own business. So she, she wears many hats at the moment. Uh, and her business, Tombow Garden Designs, leads heavily towards native plants. And today I'm very pleased to introduce Sam to talk to us more about gardens as native habitat. Uh, this, this talk came about um, when a group, uh, those of us who are involved with the, um, uh, with the Urban Bushland and Waterways Group as part of NPA, uh, were discussing the importance of habitat in our gardens as part of, uh, I guess, keeping nature connected uh, and uh, abundant within urban environments. And so we thought that it'd be great to hear from Sam and give us some clues on urban gardens uh, with, a, with a view to both native uh, vegetation as well as habitat and uh, bush tucker if we're lucky. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Sam. And thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I'm quite excited to be talking about plants and talking about bush tucker and, and talking about habitat. Um, I, I too would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're gathering on today. I'm on Camaragal country. Um, so I've lived in uh, the Lane Cove area for many years now. Um, and uh, there's a, I'm just scratching the surface of how much I know. The land has a very long history and still is and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, everything that Aboriginal people wanted or needed or used came from the land. Um, it's, um, 
you know, it comes from the land, they live on and from the land and with the land, and then everything they used and, and wanted and needed came from the land and its waters and then went back into that land. Um, so a very, very, very strong sense of connection in the short term and in the long term, um, which I would like to get more of a sense of uh, as I live my life <laughs> floating along the surface. Um, <clears throat> my background is in science and my knowledge comes from research, especially through books, um, but also local exploration. So I have a, a long passion for native plants that started at uni and um, was around before then because sometimes I see things that remind me of things that I looked at or saw or learned about in my childhood. Um, I have a passion for native plants, as I said, and I also have a strong interest in bush food and medicine, but I'm not an expert. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to meet many people over the years and learn from them, um, particularly naturalists, other conservationists, uh, academics, and members of the Dara community. Uh, Uncle Lex's dad is someone that I have spent much time talking to um, as we share knowledge. Um, I know some things more than he does, and he knows a lot more about culture, of course, and, and everything else uh, that I do. So it's been um, a constant learning experience. But I do want to make the point today that the knowledge that I'm sharing with you is my own. Uh, so any errors in here are my own. And, um, and please forgive any that you become aware of. <clears throat> uh, I do encourage anyone that's interested in bush foods to do their own research. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of information out there. Um, I do have some um, websites at the end of this talk. Uh, also have a couple of books. So um, hopefully you can see this one um, in front of my face, which I've got my background on, so it makes it a bit harder. But it's a field guide to useful native plants for temperate Australia by Caton and Hardwick. This is very, very good. Uh, and this other one oops, is Wild Food Plants. Uh, so this is by Tim Lowe wild food plants of Australia. Um, and there are plenty of other books out there as well. Uh, many of you would be familiar with Vic Cherikoff's Bush Tucker, which I also have a copy of. Um, there's always tips of different plants and, and where they come from, how they're used uh, and where they grow and, and how to grow them. Um, so today I'm going to start talking more generally about designing gardens with native plants and then gardens for habitat. Uh, and then the second half, I'll talk more about bush tucker plants and specific plants that I've come across, uh, that I've used, that I've grown, uh, and that I think are, are really interesting and cool. Not all of them are necessarily bush tucker. Um, some of them are just native plants that smell really nice and, and make me feel better. So, you know, a little bit of bush medicine. And most of the plants I talk about are found in Sydney, in and around Sydney, or up and down the East Coast. So this, uh, this slide here is the, the Bush Tucker Garden at Macquarie University, which I managed for a number of years. Um, there are many plants, so I've got some labels on here. Most of the plants in here are native um, and, and are used for either food, fibre or medicine. Uh, this garden was created in 2010 uh, and it's the site of a former car park. So it's located on the south side of the building and it's a tall building, it's about four storeys, uh, provides shade for nine months of the year. So it's quite a, a difficult environment to have a garden um, and it's not irrigated. So we have hand watered over a couple of hot dry summers, but most of the time the garden is self-sufficient. It was designed by David Harrington uh, and we did that design in consultation with uh, Warra Warra, which is now known as Walunga Muru, and that's the Indigenous Studies and Support um, Office at Macquarie University. And so I'll talk more about specific plants mentioned here a little bit later. This image is one of my favourite places in Lane Cove. It's in Lane Cove North, or technically it's actually probably West Chatswood. Uh, and it's right near the Lane Cove River. Uh, and the reason I've included this picture is it highlights the inspiration around what I'm interested in and, and the work that I do. Um, lockdown 
limited all of our abilities to get out and about. Um, for me, my favourite places for walking have been the Blue Mountains, Royal National Park and the Northern Beaches. And I couldn't get to any of those places during lockdown. So I still got out and walked almost every day. Uh, and this photo was taken on one of my regular walks. Um, the, the, the upside of being in lockdown meant that I was walking along the same pathways on a regular basis. So I was starting to see the seasonal changes up close uh, and seeing how short some of the seasons can be as well for individual species. Um, you know, the sudden appearance of plants when they flower or fruit uh, and or I would just stop and be looking at the view and realize that that a plant right in front of me or right next to one I'm looking at is a plant that I've actually known about for years, but didn't know was growing in that area. Uh, and so that's been a source of joy for the last few months and for the last few years, but, but more focused and more upfront in the last few months um, while we've been in lockdown. You know, th those plants have been there all the time, but I'm only just noticing them, um, so it, it, which has been very exciting. Um, when I walk through the bush, I'm, as well as the changing seasons, I'm also observing different birds and, and animals that live in the space. And I'm also looking at the structure. So the tree density, the height, um, whether the ground cover is a thick layer, whether the substory uh, or shrub layer is sort of one to two metres tall or half a metre tall, or maybe there's a denser mid-storey layer that's up around five metres and very dense. Uh, and this will tell me the, what the soil's like sometimes and also um, what the microclimate is like, how much moisture is being retained in the soil. Um, different birds use different spaces. Uh, so walking through Lane Cove, there are some areas that are very open and, you know, you see the birds that are very common. You see the noisy miners, maybe some currawongs and magpies, but you don't see the small birds. And yet within a couple of hundred metres, suddenly I can hear wrens or I can hear other birds that I still don't know the names of. Um, I have now identified the yellow, the, the pale yellow robin, the yellow breasted robin, one of those, um, which is a new bird for me. I didn't know that they lived so close to where I live, which is fantastic. So I, I see how the, the native bush is structured and that inspires me when I'm designing native gardens to remember those zones. So I'm not trying to create native bushland in a native garden. I'm not doing bush regeneration. That's a, a different kettle of fish and um, yeah, very different purpose. What I, and the bush, although it is beautiful and interesting, it's at a scale that doesn't always fit into a suburban garden. So my native gardens, I'm trying to design something that is interesting, beautiful and functional that's not incompatible with the surrounding area. So if it's close to bushland, I'm not going to put in something that's going to escape and become a problem or become a weed. Also, a lot of the plants that we see in the bushland that we think are, are gorgeous, are maybe not commercially available or they're spectacular for a couple of weeks of the year and then the rest of the time you don't notice them, which may or may not be something that you actually want in your garden. Uh, here's a couple of uh, plants that grow in Lane Cove. Um, the one on the left is the handsome flat pea, otherwise known as Platylobium formosum. And it grows in the more exposed sites. It's not completely exposed, but it grows near the tops of ridges. It's a drier microclimate, uh, tougher conditions. Whereas the, the image on the right is taken in a, in a gully. So a much more sheltered and much moister microclimate. Uh, and the plants uh, on the right, there's two climbers there. It's the native sarsaparilla and the wombat berry. And they like to be close to water and, and sheltered sites. So taking that idea into uh, the garden design area, I will um, try and put plants that grow in similar conditions in the same spaces in zones, so plant in zones. And the zones are about plants that, that have similar requirements for light and water, uh, but also for soil um, type. 
So the one on the left, uh, that's a garden in um, the Northern Beaches. Uh, it's an open sunny garden, so it has full sun for the whole day. It's fairly shallow soil, sandy soil on sandstone. Uh, and it's also right near the pool. So it gets a lot of splash from, from the pool water, which is you know, gonna be a little bit harder to take. Um, the garden on the right is in the inner city, it's in Surrey Hills and much more sheltered. It's shaded by some mature trees, um, so it doesn't get a lot of direct sun. Um, so different light requirements, different water requirements. Uh, and the other important thing, of course, is um, soil requirements. So some plants require uh, soils that are slightly more acidic and others more alkaline. And putting those together is a, always a good idea. Uh, and then there's the, the phosphorus discussion, which I'll get more into a little bit later. Um, but phosphorus is a, is a key factor with native plants and with native gardens and, and growing plants in Australia. Uh, there's a, um, a misconception that if you are using native plants, then you are making a low maintenance garden. This is couldn't be further from the truth. So native plants, like all plants, need maintenance and native gardens need maintenance. Um, one of the biggest things is, is an annual prune or, or possibly even more frequently. Uh, pruning is possibly my weakness. I tend to, I don't know, well, I don't avoid it, but I, I think the plant looks beautiful. And by the time I realise it should be pruned, um, two or three years have, have passed and <laughs> I probably should have pruned it in the first year. Um, so this picture here is uh, the biology garden at uh, Macquarie University. And it was updated in 2015. So we added an area, uh, which is at the bottom of the, the image, um, to support local plants that grow on sandstone soils. Uh, so we modified the soil to add um, a higher um, amount of sand and to increase the drainage um, and make it more suitable for the sandstone species. Uh, so we're growing those, those plants together because they have similar soil requirements. Um, but as well as, as pruning annually, it's also a good idea to um, fertilise annually and to mulch. So with plants, with pruning, I would normally uh, recommend pruning soon after flowering. Um, usually the best time to prune is either in autumn, um, uh, just going into winter, so that plants can be um, recovering over the winter period. Uh, and, but some plants actually flower in autumn, so you want to wait until they finish flowering and then maybe you, plant, uh, maybe you prune towards the end of winter or towards the end of summer when it's you know, just getting a little bit over, overgrown. Uh, and then with fertiliser, it will depend on the majority of the plants that you have. So if you're growing a lot of banksias and other plants that flower in autumn, you might want to fertilise in early autumn. Uh, but if, you're, if you have a lot of spring flowers, then you might want to fertilise in spring. But um, a, a special fertiliser for native plants that's low in phosphorus is highly recommended. Uh, and each year, it's usually slow release, so you, you just scatter it across the, across the ground. Uh, and mulching is also equally important and not a set and forget thing. Um, mulching is one of those things that's really best done every year. Uh, and usually around this time of the year, so that by the time uh, the, the heat picks up and the, the hot, dry summer kicks in, then there's uh, plenty of protection for the, the root zone of the plants. So very, very critical, the old maintenance. Um, and this garden here, just I um, uh, wanted to talk about phosphorus and native plants. So this garden is part of Macquarie's Earth Sciences Garden. So the Earth Sciences Garden was designed uh, back in the 80s to um, provide an education tool uh, about plant diversity, but also in the context of, um, of the continents, continental drift um, and plate tectonics. So the garden is, is a geology garden as well as a, a biology garden. Uh, and most plants diversified around the time when we had the two supercontinents Gondwana and Laurasia. And this little offshoot, this is an annex to the garden, um, which we call the Proteaceae garden because it features a lot of plants from the family Proteaceae. And these, most of the plants within this family, they have uh, specially uh, evolved a particular style of root called proteoid roots. And those roots are better able to extract the phosphorus out of the soil. 
So Australia uh, is, is widely known to be low in phosphorus in its soils, um, not everywhere, um, but there are most, many parts of Australia that are low in phosphorus and sandstone is fairly low in phosphorus. Um, and so these plants have adapted to extract more phosphorus. And so if you use a standard fertilizer on these, on soils supporting these plants, you'll actually burn them and they just won't cope and they'll keel over and die. So a special low phosphorus soil, if you're creating a, a new native garden and um, a native plant fertilizer mix, which is also low in phosphorus is always a good idea. So moving on to gardens for habitat and food, shelter and water are the key things. So when we talk about gardens for habitat, um, a lot of the time we're thinking of birds, but you can also be thinking of insects. Uh, so native bees, but also European honeybees uh, and different beneficial insects um, and invertebrates. So spiders, creepy crawlies, bugs, critters, however you want to think of them. Uh, if you're lucky, you might also be uh, creating habitat for small mammals. Um, but in, in a lot of suburban areas, we're, we're a little bit far removed from that. Uh, you don't want to be creating habitat for cats. <laughs> you want to create habitat for, for native animals if possible. Um, so the, the key things are food, shelter and water. Uh, so in this slide, we have a, a shallow open um, spun copper water dish. And it's very important that if you are making a garden for habitat, that water is provided. And it's also really important that that water is clean. So it's not enough to have a vessel that, that just has water and sits there all the time. Um, the water needs to be replenished daily. And ideally the vessel is, is cleaned daily, at least regularly. And the reason we want to do this is because we don't want algae and bacteria to build up in the water dish, in the water bath, because that can spread disease amongst uh, native birds and animals and make them sick. It's also important that the water doesn't get too hot. Uh, so um, putting the, the water in a, a semi-shaded or totally shaded area is a good idea and it needs to be safe. So this in this picture, you can see that the, the top of the, the water bath, the bird bath is open. So it's easy for birds to see what's around the water bath and to know that it's safe to actually land there. But close to the, to the bird bath is dense vegetation. So um, birds can quickly, especially small birds, can quickly hop into that dense vegetation and get away from something that's larger, like a cat or a dog or, or a larger bird and be safe. Um, and the bird bath needs to be designed so that, that birds and other animals can easily get in and get out. Uh, so there's a couple of rocks in the center of this bird bath. Um, also not just for birds, but also for lizards and other animals, bees, spiders. If they fall into the bird bath and they get, for birds, if they get too wet to fly, they need to be able to easily crawl out or walk out of, of the bird bath. So those things are all really, really important. And of course, Food and shelter are really important. So this garden here is a verge garden in Lane Cove. Uh, it's mostly native plants, but not entirely. And as you can see, there's still quite a bit of a structure. So there's, um, there's larger dense shrubs. There's um, some spreading shrubs close to the ground. There are also areas between the shrubs um, of mulched ground. So it's not completely um, packed with plants. Uh, and the larger trees have been retained. So this tree here is actually um, a dead tree and the top branches have been removed, but they're still hollows. So that's really important because not only does it provide a space for nesting and, roost and, um, and roosting, it, it also provides a, a place to land, a place to, to sit from. So if you've ever seen kookaburras out, either in the garden or in the bush, they like to sit up on a branch about two to five meters up, and then they spot things moving around. And then from there, they launch off and, and, and catch, catch their lunch, breakfast, dinner. And that's really important. So you think about all of the animals that, are, that you want to be able to use the garden. Um, and then food is also an important part. So um, the large flowering grevilleas 
like Revelia Moonlight, uh, very, very popular and very beautiful but they will favour the larger nectivorous birds. So you'll get a lot of lorikeets and also noisy miners. And a lot of us have seen noisy miners get a little bit too aggressive and start pushing the other birds out. So um, it's really important that not just the big nectar producing flowers, but also uh, seed producing plants like grasses uh, and the smaller flowers that are better for bees and, and moths and um, beetles um, and both native and European bees. So native bees, are they're um, beautiful to have in the garden. <clears throat> and this is just a, um, it's the same garden, but just around the corner. And you can see here, there's quite a few low growing um, grassy plants. Uh, and strappy leaved plants. So lots of spaces under these plants for lizards and small birds if they were nearby to shelter, um, but very, very popular with the lizards. There's quite a few lizards living in here. So very, very nice garden. <clears throat> and another thing to remember is that uh, it, native plants, are you don't need to have an all native plant garden. So um, a garden can still be a good habitat garden, even if there are a mix of natives and non-natives, because it's about function. So you, you want to provide some food, and so therefore you probably want a lot more native plants for food, but shelter can be provided by all sorts of different plants. Uh, the important thing is the, the, the variety and the structure. So in this garden, there's um, a couple of very large sandstone boulders, which provide shelter uh, for lizards and even small mammals sometimes. Um, there's some dense low growing vegetation. There's some taller, so small trees and tall shrubs. Uh, and then there's also the taller trees providing the height. And so all those different animals using different parts of the canopy and different parts of, of the vegetation structure have somewhere to be. So the, the little birds that like to be close to the ground have got somewhere to go. The birds that like to live in the what we call the mid canopy, it's a, a different group of birds. And then there's other birds that just like to be near the top and, and flitter about the top, which you very, very hard to identify because they never get close enough to, to see up close because they prefer to be 10 metres up. So um, all of these things are, are important. Uh, another important consideration is that gardens take time. So this image is of the Bush Tucker Garden, it was taken in 2014. So it's four years uh, after it was planted. Um, sometimes um, people will have an instant garden. So it depends on um, what the purpose of the garden is and, and how much time you have. Um, but ideally you'll be designing or planning to have a garden over many years that will evolve. Um, you know, a, a living canvas that, that you get totally involved in and, and part of. Um, it is possible to plan, to plan for future gardens. It doesn't all have to be planted at the same time and growing at the same rate. Um, so when you go to a nursery, plants are usually classed as annuals or perennials. So an annual is one that completes its full life cycle in one year, and then perennials uh, live for two or more years. But perennials uh, have a very varied lifespan. Some are very short-lived uh, for maybe two, two to three years, uh, and others maybe three to five or ten years. Uh, and then others much longer. So wax flowers, um, Geraldton wax from um, Western Australia is quite short lived, good for about two to three years. Um, many of the wattle species that we're familiar with are also short lived, so five to 10 years. Um, they are still valuable. So as well as being beautiful and attractive and functional um, and attractive in their own right, they, are, they provide functions and benefits for other plants in the garden. So you might have a, a wattle that's providing beautiful flowers for the first few years, but it's also acting as a nursery plant for some of the, the other plants that are slower to establish. Um, so it's, in, it's just important to remember that um, you might put some plants in at the start and then remove them later um, to make room for other plants. Um, certainly if you do plant densely straight away, you probably end up removing half the plants within six to 12 months. They're just 
all take off at once and then suddenly you've got a jungle. <laughs> and that happened a little bit in this garden, in the bush tucker garden. So four years after um, it was planted, it was quite a dense planting. Uh, and all of the, the ground covers and shrubs that you can see here, they're all filling the space. The next image that is taken six years later. So this is in 2020. And superficially, it probably looks the same, except that everything is a lot bigger. So this um, small tree at the front here, this is the gray myrtle or cinnamon myrtle. Um, in the previous slide, um, you couldn't even see it. So it's in there somewhere, but mostly what you can see here is native raspberries, uh, blue flax lilies and the ginger, um, and of course this plane tree, which never goes away. Um, the plane tree is clearly not part of the garden. It's part of a, a, an avenue of plane trees that, that runs perpendicular to the garden um, and has been there since the university was first built. Uh, so we weren't allowed to take any of the plane trees out, unfortunately, but <laughs> that's okay. It's still a beautiful garden. So this is what it looks like, looked like in 2020, uh, very clearly in need of a prune. Um, it's a, a very nicely contained jungle. So some of the shrubs that were in there in 2014 have grown much bigger um, and then others have been replaced. So these smaller shrubs here were put in in around 2016-17 to replace the Dianellas that had started to, to die out <clears throat> and not look so, so great. Uh, so yeah. Um, a living, a living garden, a living canvas. Um, so I'm moving more into talking about bush tucker plants now, and uh, I think it's um, really important to note that with native plants, there is a huge variation within a particular species depending on what time of the year it is and where it was planted. So. Um, native plants or bush tucker, I consider as not just food, but also med medicine, medicinal plants. And an individual, the value of an individual species for its food or medicinal traits or attributes does vary across time and space. Um, and this is knowledge, this is knowledge I'm aware of, but don't necessarily have. Um, it is difficult to find this knowledge in the Sydney region. A lot of um, that knowledge is around but not common. Um, the oral tradition of botanical knowledge is very strong in many parts of Australia in Indigenous, in indigenous communities. Uh, it is how knowledge and how um, knowledge and understanding of food and medicine is passed on. Um, and, and it's strongly linked to the seasons and it's strongly linked to local knowledge. So a plant could be a very, very important medicine plant at a particular time of the year, but at another time of the year, it's either useless or more critically, it may even be dangerous um, because the, the individual differences in plants, both seasonally and geographically, is much larger, I think, in some native plants than it is in the exotic plants that we're more familiar with. Um, and I think that's it's an important thing to be aware of when we are looking at bush medicine or bush tucker. Um, the plants that I'm going to talk about here are just some of the hundreds of bush tucker plants that are available along the East Coast. Most of them have useful leaves or fruit, um, but there are many plants that have edible seeds and tubers. And I'm not talking so much about those ones today, partly because it's difficult to grow tuberous plants in an area where you have brush turkeys or bandicoots or other similar critters that like to dig them up. Um, at the Bush Tucker Garden in Macquarie Uni, we planted vanilla lilies in the first year and they did well. And then they all got dug up and eaten. <laughs> and then any other tuberous flowers that I put in in following years all disappeared very quickly. So I gave up. Um, but there are many, many, many different plants to keep an eye out for. Uh, also, many native plants require treatment before they can be safely eaten. So, you know, native bush, uh, bush foods and medicine have been in cultivation for thousands of years. But unlike the plants that we're familiar with 
um, from from Europe or North America, they haven't, or other places around the world, they haven't undergone that selective breeding to the extent. Um, so, you know, peas and potatoes and pumpkins, you know, there's so many different varieties and they've all been bred to have bigger fruit or more orange or more sugar to be tastier. Whereas um, native plants, whether even though they're useful for food and they may have been cultivated in an area, they weren't bred to be necessarily to be to be bigger or tastier, as far as I am aware. So there's a little bit of experimentation and, and a lot of knowledge um, and different many things to learn. So onwards into the specific species. And I'm going to rattle off a whole bunch of plants in the next 10 minutes. Um, but they're all labelled. And as this will be recorded, you'll be able to refer back to it. So hopefully it'll be interesting and, and not too overwhelming. Uh, just a note for any botanists that happen to be watching this, I have not italicised the botanical names of the plants, just to make it a little easier to read. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, okay, so this first plant is a native ginger, Alpinia cerulea. Uh, and it is one of my favourites. I have a tendency to include this in any garden that has an ounce of shade. Um, they grow to about 1.5 to 2 metres, uh, and each stem usually lasts about two years or a little longer. And so they grow in the first year and then they flower in the second year. Uh, the leaves are beautiful, they're large and green, and they have this red back, which is a, just a selected variety. Uh, so sometimes they're all green, and then this is a selected um, popular variety that has the red leaf. Um, the, the rhizome, the part of the plant that grows under the ground, um, can be used the same way that we would use the ginger um, the, the, from Asia. Uh, it doesn't have quite the same flavour. Uh, it's not as strong um, and not as gingery, but it is definitely edible. Um, the fruit here, so the, the flowers are white and then they're followed by these blue fruits. And the blue is actually a hard capsule, but if you take the capsule part off underneath, there's a whole bunch of red brown seeds surrounded by a white pith. And that pith, that white pith, um, is kind of lemony in flavour, sort of a, a faint ginger, definitely lemony flavour, which you can chew on or you can mix in with water to make the water taste nicer. And it's quite a nice refreshing flavour. And then you just spit out the little brown seeds. Uh, the, so the whole plant is useful um, and edible, um, non-toxic, which is always good to know. It doesn't require any preparation. Uh, <clears throat> The, the leaves can be used to wrap food for cooking. They can be used to serve food. Uh, and also if you were doing an, an earthen oven, so if you were um, doing a, um, yeah, an earth oven, you can use the leaves to separate the food from the, from the fire and, and keep the food clean. This next plant, um, this is, and I do apologize, some of these photos are, are not as sharp as, would be helpful. Um, so this one is the midium, Ostromyrtus dulcis, and you can probably see that these two images are slightly different. So the, the leaf colour is one difference, but also the leaf shape. So the image on the left, the new leaves are quite pinky bronzy colour, but the leaves themselves are also wider and more ovate, uh, whereas the, the ones, the leaves on the, the right image uh, are thinner. So there's two different species that I know of in the Sydney area. Um, so Ostromyrtus dulcis is the one on the left, and then Ostromyrtus tenuifolium is the one on the right. Now the image on the on the right is is one of my um, one of my happy moments. Uh, I went for a walk up in Glenbrook along the creek, and it's the the track that is less taken. So there's the, the road track where you cross over past the Jelly Bean Pool and you go up, um, up the road. But then there's a smaller side track that follows the creek up towards the Red Hands Cave. And I was walking along there and I sat down just to 
listen to the wind and the birds and the water uh, and realised after about oh, 10, 15 minutes <laughs> that I was actually looking at Midjum at this bush and that's where this photo was taken um, and it had fruit on it. And the midium is one of the tastiest of the bush tuckers in Sydney. So it's a, it's a small round berry. It's a cream color with little um, pale purple spots and it's very sweet. So it's, a, it's soft when it's ripe and it has many tiny little seeds inside. Um, generally with bush tucker, if it has lots of tiny seeds, you can swallow them. And if it has a big seed, you spit it out. So you don't eat the big seeds, but the little seeds are okay. So midjum is one of those uh, little shrubs that you can just pull the fruit off and eat them out of your hand. Um, very, very tasty and, and a lot of fun to discover. Uh, this one is the aniseed myrtle, uh, Bacchausia anisata. Uh, it's also um, used to be known as Syzygium anisatum, um, so closely related to um, yeah, that family of of lily pillies. Um, but this one, this doesn't produce a, it produces a capsule rather than a, a fruit. So the aniseed myrtle is used for the leaves. So the leaves are, are quite a light green. You can see they have wavy margins and sort of a yellowish green uh, and a very, um, a very refreshing, um, not too sharp aniseed smell. Uh, and you can use them to flavor foods. Um, so they don't have medicinal properties as far as I'm aware, but um, can be used as a flavoring both in sweet and savory dishes if you like the, the aniseed flavor. Uh, and they like shaded areas um, and they, they, they grow quite, quite easily um, and they're very pretty. So they have the pale yellow leaves and the, the stems are kind of a, an orangey, orangey brown color, which is really nice. This next one is the lemon myrtle. And I also have lemon myrtle with me. I picked these this morning. So lemon myrtle is possibly the second most like widely known bush tucker or native food from Australia. Um, and it is, in terms of, um, you know, taking people around a garden and showing things to them, this is probably the, the most popular. It smells really refreshing and it's really, really nice. And it grows really easily. It's quite a tall tree in nature, but it can be um, hedged and, and shrubbed um, very easily. So pruned regularly. And I realize I'm running out of time, so I whip through these. Um, this next one is appleberry, uh, Bellardiera scandens. Um, so I've got the nice picture of the flower, which is in flower at the moment. So this is a twining climber, sort of scrambles over other plants. So these other two images um, is the same. It's the, that plant actually growing on another tree. And this bottom image here, you can see that round or sort of oblong shape, that's the fruit. So the appleberry um, is in flower at the moment and in fruit. It pretty much flowers and fruits all year. The important thing with the appleberry is that the fruit can't be eaten until it falls off the ground. So it's actually very hard to get these when they're out in the bush because you'll see them on the plant, but you won't see any on the ground because other animals have already got them. Um, but it's, yeah, so it's one that you can't eat straight off the shrub um, unless you cook it first. Uh, blue flax lily is a popular plant. So you will often see various cultivars in the nursery. The, this one, Dianella cerulea, is one of the ones that's edible. There's two Dianella species that are edible. I can't remember the name of the other one. Um, but for my personal take, it's not the tastiest of um, bush foods. So I would grow it for its flowers and because it's pretty, wouldn't necessarily grow it to eat. But it has blueberries and when they're soft, they're ripe. Um, river peppermint is one of my all-time favourites. Uh, it's a quite a large tree um, and it has very, very weeping leaves. And I did pick some leaves this morning as well. Uh, and being, uh, so it's a eucalyptus, eucalyptus alata. Uh, and the name peppermint gives you a sense of how it smells. So it's got more peppermint oil in the leaves. Um, and of course it's a eucalyptus, so it has eucalyptus smell as well. So it has the two different oils, the piperol oil and the eucalyptol oil. 
And these are really good for helping you to breathe easier. So I think of this as a medicinal plant. Um, and it because it's, you know, you can sniff it and it and you and you feel better, it makes helps you to breathe easier. You can also put it in a bowl with hot water and, and breathe in the steam. <clears throat> Uh, the wombat berry is a is a another climber and grows in gully areas. So Eustrephus latifolius. Um, this one looks quite similar to another plant called Smilax. So the difference is that the leaves of the Eustrephus are um, smaller, brighter green, um, softer, but they have the parallel veins. Whereas the Smilax has kind of three distinctive parallel veins rather than lots of parallel veins. The other important thing is that it has these orange fruits. Now the fruit, um, you don't eat the whole fruit, but inside the orange is a, is a pith um, and small seeds. And again, it's the pith that you can chew on and eat. It has a pleasant flavor. I haven't actually tried this one, so I don't know how pleasant it is. Um, and also this plant has tubers, uh, which can be eaten. Uh, so it's probably more for the tubers and the fruit that you would grow this. I think it's called wombat berry because the tubers are popular with wombats. Another favourite of mine, sandpaper fig. Uh, so this grows in the Sydney area in gullies, uh, Ficus coronata. So it has these um, reddish brown fruits, reddish purple fruits when they're ripe and they're only tiny, so about a centimetre diameter. But these are one of the sweetest, tastiest figs in Sydney, so they're not dry very, very tasty. And as you can guess by the common name, the leaves can be used like sandpaper. Uh, so very, very useful plant. And one to spot when you're out walking. Macadamia would be the number one um, bush food um, of Australia, although first commercially grown in Hawaii. So maybe not many people know that it actually is native to Australia until recently. Um, but we do have you know, our commercial crops now. Um, macadamias are in flower right now. So it's a really good time to, to spot them as you walk out. They have these beautiful um, streams of flowers and of course macadamia nuts. So this is with the husk still on uh, and then take the husk off and you've got that, that hard brown smooth nut. Um, and then there's the mint bush. So mint bush is probably a misnomer. Um, I, I would never use this in place of mint. What you could do, though, is you could use it in place of oregano or thyme um, as a seasoning. It's very strong. You only need a little bit, uh, but it smells really nice and it's a good insect repellent as well. <clears throat> and in flower, right, it's starting to flower right now, so it's a good one to look for. Uh, native raspberry is probably the, the second last one of the really easy to eat ones. Um, so this is Rubus rosifolius, and it's like a crunchy raspberry. But if you live on the northern beaches or near the northern beaches, I would highly recommend visiting Kimbricky uh, Sustainability Centre. So at Kimbricky, um, I still think of it as Kimbricky Tip because I grew up around there, um, but it's much, much flashier now. And they have a, um, a sustainability resource centre and native garden, and they have the most incredible native raspberry bushes. They're about three metres tall and they're absolutely covered in delicious fruit. So highly recommend a visit. Uh, warrigal greens is one of the few leafy greens that um, is readily available. So this is Tetragonia tetragonioides, beautiful name, love it. Um, diamond shaped leaves, uh, kind of furry and soft, almost succulent. Uh, this can be used like spinach, but it's important to blanch it first. Uh, because it um, contains um, um, an ingredient, a chemical that breaks down with heat, but can cause, um, can make you sick if you eat too much of it. You'd have to eat a lot to get sick, but it's a good idea to eat the young leaves and to blanch them first as well. Uh, lily pilly, I think is my last, pretty much my last one. Um, so lily pillies uh, or magenta cherries, um, there are several different species. I would recommend Syzygium austral or Syzygium paniculatum or the various cultivars. And these are the ones you'll see around. So the ones that produce edible fruit are interesting, uh, very tasty. I can think of these like a tiny apple. So you eat it like an apple, you eat around the seed and then just throw the seed around. And also they make good jam. So very, very delicious. I was, yeah, these are delicious. 
highly recommend them. Uh, and then this, um, this slide is just four other species that, um, that I've either grown or that I would recommend. So the finger lime is very, very popular and grows very well in Sydney. Um, so there's very much easier to get these days. Uh, the grey or cinnamon myrtle, Bacchausia myrtifolia, is native to the Sydney region. You'll often find that in, um, in temperate rainforest. Uh, and it has the same um, oils as or same uh, flavorings as you find in, in nutmeg, um, in a couple of other things I can't remember the name of. <laughs> um, tarragon, nutmeg, tarragon, and parsley. So it's similar overlap with the flavorings. Uh, and then down the bottom, blueberry ash, which many of us will be familiar with. Um, the, the fruit, the, the flesh is very thin uh, and it's only ripe when it's soft and not particularly tasty, but it is a very beautiful tree uh, and very common around Sydney. And then the one in the middle here is the zigzag vine. This is Melodorum lycartii. These are the flower buds um, that smell like um, banana when they open. Uh, and the fruit is um, rich in vitamin C. So it's from the Northern Territory. So that was a, a very rushed skip through some bush tucker plants. Um, and so just to finish before I take questions, just wanted to leave with you um, some websites of different gardens uh, and nurseries where you can find native plants and bush tucker plants. So thank you very much. Wow, Sam, that was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I have learned uh, so much. Um, uh, I, I must admit my knowledge of bush tucker and, and native plants was pretty slim. So uh, I feel like I've just sat through a, a sort of an avalanche of new information and it's just fantastic. Yeah, sorry, um, that was a bit of a sprint towards the end. <laughs> oh, no, it's great. It's great. But I must correct you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I can't think that the macadamia is the right name for it. I grew up calling them Queensland nuts. Oh, that's a different species. Is it? <laughs> no, no, I mean, they, yeah, that's the they same. They much the same. They are native to New South Wales as well as Queensland. <laughs> uh, so thanks, thanks for that. Um, just to pick up a couple of questions. One of, the, one of the things that you mentioned on the way through were cats, mm. and I'm sure we're all a bit worried about cats. Uh, have you got any hints or tips for us if we're trying to manage the cats that invade our gardens? Not really. Um, discouragement. So making, providing shelter um, that cats can't get to. Uh, so for, for a bird bath, you, could, you can hang it from a place that the cat can't get to or a high enough up, you know, raised up on a pedestal so the cat can't get to it. Um, there are plants that they probably find unattractive, which I can't think of off the top of my head, but a bit of research into that possibly. Um, but yes, cats are difficult. Um, <laughs> but just discouraging, chasing them off. Chasing them off, yeah. Chasing them off. And, yeah. and don't find any catnip and don't have a sand pit because they, yes. they love using gardens as toilets. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned on the way through uh, the seasons, and this is probably the topic for a completely different talk, but have you got any thoughts on or comments to make on the seasons we have in Sydney? I think a full talk would be absolutely fantastic. I made a couple of notes and then thought, this is ridiculous, it's too big a topic. So um, there is a, an Indigenous seasonal cal calendar, um, but, of course, every every Indigenous nation, every Indigenous group would have its own um, seasonal calendar depending on where they live. Um, I know that Darawal has a seasonal calendar that's published. Uh, also, some local government um, local government's, uh, websites have some information on seasons, on Australian seasons or Indigenous seasons, and they're very much tied to... Um, to they're not tied to the months that we know they're tied to what happens with rainfall and temperature so the season of you know when when the mint bush starts flowering that will coincide with when a particular animal is available um for either for harvesting or for you know certain things happen at certain times of the year and they're all interconnected so when something is flowering that means it's habitat or food 
for something else or it's a it's a sign it coincides with the behavior of a, of a different plant and animal uh, or when the fish are running or when the fish are breeding so yeah there's a lot there that I would like to know more about <laughs> Oh, well, I think maybe we'll um, we'll explore that one for another well, topic. It's a fasc it. fascinating area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, oh, just one quick question: Is mm -hmm. pig face edible? Uh, pig face, yes, it is. Um, uh, <laughs> palatable is a different question, um, but it is <laughs> edible. It, it is edible. So you would go for the young, the young shoots because they'd be. Um, less bitter than the older ones and they're slightly salty um also the fruits are edible so the flowers um after the flowers are finished there's this juicy bright red um fruit that's described like a kind of a salty uh, lolly so it's sweet and salty and mm, yum. nutritious mm. Mm. now we're running out of time unfortunately i've got a few more questions but um maybe we can Think of some other way of, of exploring some of those at another time. Um, so thank you so much for that, Sam. That was that was that was excellent. Really enjoyed that. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming along. Um, we had you know lots of attendees. I had nearly sixty attendees, which is great. So uh, it's really good to to uh, be able to share all this knowledge with all of you. Now next week we've got another another webinar, uh, which will be quite interesting. Um, and um, slightly different topic though. Uh, next week where it's about luxury lodges, wilderness lost. Hmm, do they equal wilderness lost? And our speaker is James McCormack, who's the editor of Wild Magazine. So um, that will be great. Thank you for that. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye.